Hey everybody, today I've got another Substance Painter tutorial for you. Today I'm going to show you guys how to make this automatic dynamic zombie skin brush. And what's really cool is when you paint on your model, it starts looking kind of bruised and rotten and discolored. And then the more you paint over it, the deeper into the body it seems to dig until you expose all the guts and the bones and all that gross stuff. And if you look on Rendercrate, you'll notice that we recently uploaded these texture variations for our universal characters. And this is actually how I created our two zombie characters. So if you just need a zombie texture and you don't want to go through the process of making it yourself, these textures are here for you. Now if you do want to follow along and learn Substance Painter, we're putting a link to all of my project files down in the description so that you can download it and follow along. If you've been watching our Substance Painter tutorials over the past few months, we're going to be using a lot of the same techniques that we've been learning. But in this video, we're going to bring it all together into one big project. You don't need to go back and watch those videos if you don't want to, but if you're new to Substance Painter, I actually recommend watching all of our Substance videos to get up to speed. This tutorial will work with your own human character if you have one already, but if you don't and you want to follow along with exactly what I'm doing, this is what you'll find inside of that download. So there's an FBX, that's the model, and then there's a maps folder that has a bunch of color maps for different skin tones and then his normal maps. Alright, let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is set up our project and bake our maps just like we did with the alien skin tutorial. So I'll go file new, I'll click on select, and I'll navigate to that FBX. Now this character uses UDIMS, which means it's one model, but it has three different UV tiles or, or texture sets. So you want to make sure you click on use UV tile workflow. And then under import baked maps, click on add, and just select and import all of these textures. Okay, first thing we have to do is bake our mesh maps so that our smart materials work. So the first thing we need to do is apply the normal map because that's how all the other maps get created. So click on the texture set settings window. Mine's on the left side because I've kind of rearranged my interface. Yours might be on the right. Scroll down to where it says select normal map and you can click on this and choose the normal map, which is the blue one. And you should see all of the detail appear on his body. He's got all these wrinkles and skin pores. It's pretty cool. Okay. Now I'm going to click on this little croissant icon in the top right and let's change our output size to 4K. Now these are the maps that we're going to be creating. We don't need to create a normal map because we already have it. If you click on world space normal, there's no options for you. Uh, we also don't need to create an ID map in this case because there's only one object. For ambient occlusion, I'm going to crank up the secondary rays just for more detail. Same thing for curvature. But in this case where it says method generate from mesh, we don't have a high res version of this character. So we want to change that to generate from normal map. And then lastly, under the thickness, we want to crank up the secondary rays again and then click on bake selected textures. Depending on how fast your computer is, this could take a little while. So just be patient. Okay. And when it's done, go up here and click on the paintbrush to go back to paint mode. Okay. At this point, I like to check my maps and if they're okay, I like to save the project. So to check the maps, you're going to press B for bake, and that's going to cycle through all the maps that we created. So this one here is the ID map, and we didn't create one, so just press it again. And here's the ambient occlusion map. This is all the shadows that are in the deep recesses. I just want to make sure that I see the actual skin detail in the map. That's how you know it worked. So he's got all those pores and wrinkles. It's good. If I press B again, we got curvature. And again, I'm making sure that it has all of the bumps and pores and wrinkles. And that's all we really need to check, so let's press M for material to go back to the normal view. Alright, let's save the project, very important, and we're ready to go. Okay, before we can get started creating the zombie skin, we're going to recreate the original skin material to paint on top of. That's going to be very simple. Let's click this paint bucket to create a new fill layer, and we'll call this um, human skin. And grab whichever skin tone you want to work on, and drop it onto the base color. Now this is really easy to swap out, and it's actually a good idea to swap it out as we work. So as we create our zombie textures, we can test it on top of all the other skin tones and see the results. So it's really easy to swap out right here. He's looking a little bit too shiny, so let's increase the roughness to at least 0.5, maybe even a little bit more. Alright, so the next phase, before we start doing all the wounds and the rotting and all that gross stuff, let's give it sort of a zombie tint, like a sickly undead tint to the skin. So I'm going to create a new layer and I'll call this one zombie skin tone. And for this, I only want to affect the color channel. So let's turn off all of the other channels here. I'm not sure what color I want the tint to be, but let's just pick for now, just a very pale sickly green. This is very easy to adjust later on. And then just like in Photoshop or After Effects, we can adjust the blending mode. So that's right here. Let's try soft light and we can see it's tinting the original skin tone sort of green and try overlay. 
can try tint, which might be a little bit too intense. I think I'll go with soft light. And now that I have this set up, I'm going to adjust the hue. Let's go with like a pale blue. If we want to adjust the color of the original skin without destroying it, we can create basically the equivalent of like an adjustment layer. So in between the zombie skin tone and the human skin, we can create a blank layer by clicking on this paintbrush. Now this is a blank and empty layer, there's nothing on it, but if I set the blend mode to pass through, I can put effects and adjustments and filters on this layer and it will affect everything below it. So on layer two, let's add a filter and I'll search for HSL, which is hue saturation and levels. Maybe I can lower my saturation. You can adjust the lightness of it if you want. You could even tint the original skin tone here if you want to go for something really high fantasy. But I think I just want to lower the saturation a little bit. And we can name layer two skin adjustment. And this is non-destructive. I can always turn this off to get the original skin tone back. Okay, let's add some darkness to his eye sockets and his cheekbones to give him that undead look. So I'm gonna add a new fill and I'll call this something like deep darkness. It's very moody. Again, I only want to affect the color channel and let's pick something probably too dark for now. We can always adjust it later. I'm gonna set my blending mode again to maybe soft light. And now we're gonna paint where this darkness appears on the body. So let's click here and add a black mask to my layer. So this is a layer mask just like in Photoshop, which means you can paint white to reveal it or black to get rid of it. If you ever want to see the mask itself, you can alt click on the mask and that reveals just your painting. To go back to the full view, press M for material. Okay, I'm going to turn on symmetry, which is this button right here, and I'll pick a nice soft sort of scattered looking brush. So over here in the brushes, I can search for one called maybe dirt and let's turn down the stroke opacity and just very lightly add some darkness to the eye sockets. It's kind of speckly and noisy which is good because it gives us sort of a random distribution, but if it ends up looking too sharp, we can blur this layer later on. I'm also gonna add a little bit of darkness under his cheekbone. Now, as you're working, you'll probably notice that your colors aren't exactly right. Uh, again, the colors are adjustable really easily. So I like to just pick colors that are sort of obvious and high contrast so I can see where I'm painting. You can always go back and adjust the colors themselves up here. Let's create another fill layer for the bony landmarks. So I'm gonna click fill and I'll call this bony landmarks. Again, I want to just paint color and let's pick a pale yellow. So this is going to be all the points on the body where the bone is close to the surface because the skin is looking kind of thin and papery because we're making an undead creature. So we can set this to soft light like the other layers, but remember you can always change this stuff if it doesn't look right. Let's add a black mask and now I'm going to paint anywhere that the cheekbones are maybe close to the surface. I'm going to kind of outline his skull wherever his skin is really thin. Don't be afraid to overpaint. You can always dial it back. You can always turn down the opacity. You can blur your masks. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So don't feel like it's set in stone. You don't have to paint it perfectly in one go. I'm gonna focus mostly on his face for the sake of speed in this video, but you could go around the entire body and do this for all of the bony landmarks if you want to, like his collarbone, maybe his elbow and his forearm, obviously his knees, his knuckles and all that good stuff. Again, if you feel like these masks are too sharp or maybe you overpainted, you can go back to your mask, like for the deep darkness, press X to invert your brush and start painting black. And that's gonna remove some of the shading that we did on the cheek here. Now, if I press Alt click on this mask, I can see where I painted. And if I wanna blur it, you can actually add filters to the masks themselves. So I clicked on this mask, I'm gonna click on add effect, filter. And in this case, I'm gonna choose blur. And over here in the parameters, you can adjust the blur intensity. So if it's looking too sharp and speckly and sort of noisy, we can soften it up with blur intensity. Okay, overall he's looking a little too purple, so I think I'm gonna change my deep darkness to look more red. Okay, we could spend a ton of time on this, adding a lot of detail, and I actually recommend it. If you go watch our alien skin painting tutorial, I have a ton of tips in there on how to do little veins, extra little bumps and all that stuff, but I don't want to spend too much more time on the skin, even though it's looking very simple, because we've already covered it. Just to keep things organized, let's move some of these into folders now. So I'm going to create a new folder at the top and call this Zombie Skin. And I'm going to move Bony Landmarks, Deep Darkness, and Zombie Skin Tone into Zombie Skin. And you notice that our blending mode changed. That means we need to set our Zombie Skin folder to pass through. And that way, the blending modes of these layers inside of the group are respected. 
So let's minimize the group. So let's try to move on to that sort of rotten skin brush. For this, I need to create a few different materials and we're gonna dynamically and automatically blend them together. So I'm gonna create a bruise material. I'm gonna create sort of a bloody meaty guts material and we're gonna create bone. So let's start by creating a bruise material. So if we look at some bruise reference, we can break this down into three or four different layers. So I'm gonna create sort of a saturated cloudy yellow orange and then same thing with a red and a purple and then maybe we'll add in some veins and stuff like that. So starting with the yellow, I'm gonna create another fill, call it bruise yellow. And I just want to affect the color. And let's pick a yellow. Start with something pretty saturated. Try setting it to soft light or overlay if you want it to be really saturated and high contrast. But after you change that, you may have to adjust the color some more. So remember that that's never set in stone. And now I want some variation in this yellow. So on this layer, I'm gonna click and add a fill and I only want to adjust the color, so let's turn off all those channels. And now I want sort of a random cloudy noise. So if I click on the base color, I can search for cloud. And let's try cloud three. And I'll set this fill to overlay. It's a little bit too much. Maybe we can play with the opacity. Now you may notice now that we're starting to get seams where our UV tiles end. So to make sure that doesn't happen, I want to switch our projection method from UV projection to triplanar projection. And now it will create this pattern across the UV tiles. We can also increase the tiling to get smaller clouds. So I wanna make the pattern pretty small because we're not gonna see it over large areas, just in small areas like around his eye socket or wherever a bruise might appear. Now that I see this, I think that overlay might be too high contrast for this cloud. So let's change the overlay blending mode to soft light. Okay, cool. Let's actually duplicate bruise yellow, control D, and I'll call this bruise red. Now it's conflicting with the yellow layer, so let's temporarily turn off bruise yellow. And let's change this layer up so it's more of a red layer. So I'll change the original layer to red. Maybe I'll switch this cloud back to overlay for some more contrast. And just to make sure that the patterns from the yellow and the red don't line up, let's just change the tiling a little bit. And I'm going to bring the yellow layer back on. Looks a little crazy right now, but don't worry. Let's click on the red layer and add a black mask because we don't want the red to cover the entire bruise. If we look back at our reference, we can see the bruise is mostly yellow with some cloudy splotches of red. So let's add a black mask to the red. And then with the mask selected, we can go to add fill. And then in the fill right here, we can change it from uniform color to maybe clouds three again. Once again, I wanna change the projection method from UV projection to triplanar to get rid of those UV seams. Greatly increase the tiling and I want sort of a sharper edge, so let's increase the contrast. And you can also adjust the balance here if you want to. Now that we see the yellow and the red together, we can make adjustments to our colors. Maybe I'll desaturate that red a little bit. All right, and let's duplicate a uh, bruise red. And once again, we're gonna change this to the next one, which is sort of a purple. And then the main thing we wanna change here besides changing it to purple is update the cloud pattern so that the purple splotches don't align perfectly with the red ones. So on the mask for the purple layer, Click on clouds and just adjust the tiling. Oops, I forgot to name my layer. Okay, and this looks pretty crazy. And I know I keep restating this, but don't ever feel like these colors are set in stone. It's hard to know what the colors should be until you see it all in context together. Okay, let's add one more layer and that's gonna be the veins. So let's actually grab bruise red and duplicate that. Maybe I'll move it up to the top and I'll call this red veins. And under the mask for red veins, let's click on clouds and let's change it to a different pattern. For veins, I like to use one called plasma. It makes sort of a squiggly pattern. Now, if we alt click on the red veins mask, we can see it's not quite right. First of all, it needs to be inverted. So under the plasma, come down here and choose invert and change it to true. Let's increase the contrast, but also increase the balance to sort of tighten that up. And we'll go back to our material. We can see that the veins are too big, so let's increase the tiling, maybe to about 40, but it really depends on your project settings. So don't just use the same numbers that I'm using. Okay, and now we don't want it to be completely covered in veins. So on top, I'm gonna add another fill and let's choose something cloudy and random, but we've used that cloud fill a lot. So let's try one that I like called moisture. So to see what we're doing, I'm gonna alt click on the red veins mask and we can see that the moisture noise is just sort of covering everything up. But if I change this to multiply, we can see that it's gonna be cutting out and darkening those veins where we don't want them. 
So let's increase the contrast of the moisture noise and also lower the balance so that we see just a few veins. We can also change the tiling settings for moisture noise to create more smaller and more random splotches. Now don't forget to check it in the full material view so you can see what you're actually doing. At this point, it's just a matter of adjusting the contrast and the balance to get the amount of veins that you want. Okay, now this is looking pretty crazy. So let's test painting it in just a few places on the body. So at the very top, I'm gonna to create another folder and we'll call this bruises. And let's drop all four of our layers for the bruise into the bruises folder. Now you'll notice that that changes our blending mode for everything again. So on the bruises folder, you wanna change that to pass through. Okay, and now with all of our bruise layers in that folder, we can mask off the folder itself so that we can paint all four of those layers onto the model at the same time. So on the bruises folder, let's click here and go add black mask. And now I can paint wherever I want the bruise. And now you can see why I didn't really worry too much about the exact colors I was picking because it's hard to judge what it's gonna look like until you're painting it on the model. So this is probably a little too saturated. I won't do it all on camera, but I generally like to go back at this point and fiddle with all the different colors until I get something that looks good in context. So all this stuff is still live, it's totally non-destructive. We're kind of just setting up our building blocks at first, and once we have everything, we can make our fine adjustments. Sometimes I like to add some of my bruise material into the deep sockets, and just areas that I think will make it look good as a zombie. Like maybe his fingers turned purple. Okay. So the bruises building block is done for us. It doesn't need to be painted onto the body all perfectly right now. Let's finish setting up our building blocks before we create our finished character. So the next building block we need is sort of a gooey bloody meat for the under layer. So I'm gonna create a new fill and I'll call this one guts large because we're gonna create two different sizes. So to create these sort of round sort of pustules and nodules and nasty muscle fibers, I'm gonna use a noise called cell. So click on base color and search for cell. And we're looking for cell noise number one right here. Now you don't want to adjust the scale under the noise parameters. If you need to adjust the tiling, you wanna do it up here on the tiling setting. And that's because we're gonna use this same noise for the roughness and for the height. And so if we adjust it here and not down here, it will line up in all three channels. Really quickly though, we are getting these texture seams. So let's change our projection method from UV to triplanar. And we can turn off all the channels except for color right now, because that's all we need to worry about. If you press C until you find the base color channel, we can see kind of a clearer view of what's going on. Right now it looks a little bit like a cracked pattern. I'm gonna adjust my tiling to about two or three. And now I wanna remap these to be shades of red instead of black and white. So to my guts layer, I'm gonna click on add filter and I'm gonna search for gradient. And what this does is it lets you remap the values to different colors. So all of the black pixels, just for example, I could say make those green and you can see all the darkest pixels turn green. Then the midtones, I could say, let's make that blue. And then the white pixels, I could say, make it pink. So that's how this filter works. But let's pick some more realistic colors for our project. You can also adjust the color positions with these sliders if you want more of this dark red. I think this is looking pretty good. Let's go back to our main layer and let's add in the height layer so we can get that round bumpiness. So I'm gonna click on height and then down here on the height channel, I'm gonna click the exact same cell noise and it should line up with the colors. Now it looks a little bit crazy, but we can adjust that. On the guts large layer, I'm gonna click this little magic wand again and choose add levels. So I don't want to adjust the base color. I want to switch this to height. And I'm going to bring this slider down to the left. And you can see how this adjusts the height contrast. So let's bring it about right here. And now that I'm looking at it, it looks a little bit too clean and perfect. It's kind of, you know, it's based on a procedural noise. So it needs to be a little messier and a little more organic. So I'm going to click on gradient so that I can add a new filter in between gradient and the levels. And let's add a filter and then we'll choose a filter and scroll all the way down and choose warp. And we can see that just messes up our perfectly clean little cell lines. It's a little bit too much. We can adjust the intensity, turn that down a little bit. And that makes it look a little more organic and natural. Okay, pretty nasty. Okay, and let's add in some roughness to make it look shiny and wet. So clicking back on the layer itself, I'm gonna turn on the roughness channel. 
And here under the roughness slider, we could just manually adjust the entire layer. If I turn it down, it's gonna get more shiny. If I turn it up, it's gonna get less shiny. But let's actually add that cell noise in there so that we have some different roughness or shininess levels so that the deeper it goes into the guts, the more wet and gross it looks. So under roughness, I'm gonna add cells. Now it's way too high contrast. You can see that the highest levels are really dry like paper and then the deepest levels are sort of bloody and shiny. So I'm gonna press C for color until I see the roughness channel appear. And I'm gonna add a levels to adjust the roughness. So click on the little magic wand and go add levels. And let's change this to the roughness channel. And now the darker the pixel, the shinier it's gonna be. So the highest pixels are pure white, which means they're just like matte paper. So let's turn those way down so we get a really shiny material. Pretty cool. Now again, if you want more contrast, you can just bring this back up and you'll get less shine on the surface. Or if you want the whole thing to be pretty shiny, you can bring this way down like that. Okay, so we have our building blocks to make our meat. Let's adjust the colors a little bit. So I feel like the red is a little bit too bright. So I'm gonna darken down all of the reds in my gradient. Remember though that the gradient is being driven by that original cell noise. So we can actually darken the original cell noise to adjust this red. So if I click on my guts large layer and I go to base color, you can play around with the contrast and the balance. Just don't touch the scale here because that will make it fall out of alignment with the height and the roughness. So I'm gonna increase the balance or I guess decrease the balance and that will darken it so we get more of those darker colors. I wanna create sort of the impression of like pustules, as gross as that sounds. We are making a rotten zombie guy. Okay, and then instead of just doing shades of red, it looks a little bit too flat. I'm gonna click on my, maybe my third color here and make it a little bit more orange, just for some variation. Not very much, just a little bit. Now it looks a little bit too uniform, so one last little touch to break it up and make it look like it has more natural variation. At the very top of my effects stack right here, I'm gonna add a fill and I wanna add a fill just for the color. And instead of filling a solid color, let's choose that moisture from before because I like that pattern. On this moisture noise, I'm gonna change the projection method from UV projection to triplanar and I'll set the blending mode to overlay. And you can see how that just breaks up the uniform redness. Oh, and don't forget that if it's too intense, you can always turn down the opacity of the entire layer. Okay, so that's guts large. Let's duplicate the entire layer and I'll call this one guts small. And for now, let's turn off the visibility for guts large. Now, I just wanna change a couple things with this. First, I wanna click on the layer itself. And this is where we plugged in all of the cell noise. If I come up here to the top and change the tiling, maybe I'll change it to like six we get much smaller little nodules and pustules. <laughs> I think I'm gonna turn down the warp so we get a more clear roundness to these little bumps. And maybe under the levels for the height, I'll increase the contrast by turning up this white one here. And then lastly, I'm gonna change the brightest color in my gradient to something that looks really gross, like maybe a yellow or a green. You can go as intense or as weird or as realistic or as nasty as you want. And then just as a personal preference, I'm going to grab the color two position and drag it to the right. And that's just gonna lower the size of those little blisters. Gross. Okay, so now we have a problem. When I turn the guts large layer back on, we can see that the height is sort of influencing the smaller guts. You might like that or not. If you don't want that to happen, click on guts small and change to the height channel right here. And then on the gut small layer, I'm gonna change the blending mode from linear dodge to normal. And that just means that the height channels for each of the layers won't interact with each other. Now, why did we create two different layers? Well, I can add a black mask to the guts small layer. And then on the black mask, I can add a fill. And then for the fill, I can choose some sort of a cloudy noise, like either clouds or moisture. And that's gonna reveal those little blisters wherever I want in random patches. So let me just adjust the mask so it has a pretty high contrast. And anywhere you see white, those little tiny blisters should show through. Now, if you make your mask a little bit too high contrast, you could either lower the contrast or maybe you can add a blur to the mask. And we'll add a blur. 
I'm not blurring my actual material, just the mask between the two materials. Once again, we're just creating building blocks for ourselves. Once we have all of these layers, you can go back and change any slider that we've set up so far and really drastically change the look of your zombie. Okay, that's pretty gross. Let's create some bone now. And for that, I wanna create my own bone material, similar to the way I created my own metal material in this previous substance painter video for this pig creature's armor. So up on production crate, I'm gonna go to graphics, and maybe I'll go into the dirt and grunge category and find something that I could change into bone. So let's check out rock. Bone doesn't have that much contrast in the colors, but we can always adjust that in Substance Painter. And the colors don't have to look like bone, we can also adjust that. So I'm gonna grab a few of these textures and we'll try them out. And this here is the texture that I went with. It's got some nice little scratches in it that could look cool as bone. Uh, one thing I recommend before you import this into Substance Painter though, is get rid of any numbers at the end of the file name because sometimes Substance Painter will think that's a UDIM tile and it'll put the texture somewhere way off in space instead of on your character's body. So just change that file name and then I'll show you how to import it into Substance. So if you ever need to import textures into Substance Painter, go up to File, Import Resources, and then choose Add Resources and navigate to the texture that you wanna import. What's really cool is if you import multiple textures, you can give them tags so that you can search for them later. So right here, I'm gonna type in production crate. And that way, if I lose track of the file, I can always search for it. Let's also click where it says undefined and tell it that this is a texture. And now here where it says import resources to, because I'm making bones specifically for this project, I'm gonna attach it to my project. Before we drop this onto the model, let's organize our guts material really quick. So I'm gonna create a new folder at the top and I'll call this zombie guts. And let's drag and drop the guts small and guts large into the zombie guts folder. And we can close the folder and hide it for now. Okay, let's add a new fill and I'll call this bone. Let's choose a nice starting bone color, whatever shade looks good to you. I'm also gonna set my roughness level, maybe around 0.4. And let's add a new fill to the bone layer and I'm gonna turn off everything except the color channel on this fill. And now we can drag and drop our texture from Production Crate right here under base color. Looks a little bit crazy right now, but let's change the projection method from UV projection to triplanar. We can also increase our tiling and let's play around with the blending mode. Soft light looks pretty cool, but we can also adjust the opacity if it's too much. Okay, click on the fill that we just created and add a roughness channel and we'll drop that same texture into roughness. And the reason we did this on the same fill is so that the roughness and the color texture line up with each other. Let's press C for color until we get to the roughness. And we can see that the roughness is very high contrast. Remember, black pixels are very shiny like glass and white pixels are very matte like paper. So we need to add a levels adjustment and we'll switch it to roughness. And let's lower the contrast by bringing these two bottom sliders together. Now, if you bring them together farther to the left, we'll get a darker texture, which means shinier. And if we bring them together farther to the right, the overall roughness will be brighter and less shiny. All right, back on the original fill right here. Let's also turn on the height channel and drop that same texture into height. That's gonna look really crazy. So let's add another levels adjustment. And this one is gonna be for the height channel and we wanna bring this very close together near the middle. We wanna really lower that contrast. And another thing we can do is grab this middle slider right here, this gray one, and we can drag this to the right to create a mostly flat surface with some pits. And that will give you the effect of pitted bone. So it looks a little weird because his whole body looks like it's made of bone, even the muscles, but this is only gonna appear on the parts of his body where his bone is close to the surface, like on his skull, or on the bridge of his nose and things like that. Okay, and I think our bone building block is now done. And now that the bone is done, we can paint it only to the areas where we want to see the bone on top of the guts. So let's turn the guts layer back on. And you'll notice we kind of have a problem where the height information from the guts layer is appearing on the bone layer. So let's change our channel here back to height. And then on the bone layer, I'm gonna change the blending mode from linear dodge to normal. And that just means it's not gonna combine the height layers of these two materials. So the next thing I wanna do is create a black mask for the bone. And that way I can paint it only where I want 
to see the bone, and that's going to be on the bony landmarks of this character. So if I paint really quick as a test, we'll see that it's working, but it looks like the bone is actually deeper in than the blood and guts level, and I want the bone to be on top. So what I'll do is open up zombie guts, and remember we have two layers in here. We have the guts small and the guts large. I'm going to hide guts small for now. And we're going to adjust the height of this layer so that it goes deeper down than the bone. So it looks like the bone is sitting on top. So in guts large, we already have a levels adjustment for the height. I'm just going to bring both of these sliders to the left so that it looks like the bone sits on top. And hopefully you're able to see that in the video that the bone looks like it's on a higher level. Now we'll do the same thing for guts small. Let's turn that back on and I'm going to grab the levels height and we'll bring these two sliders down as well. And back on the bone mask, I can invert my brush and paint this away. And now I'm going to manually paint the bony landmarks of this character to be bone instead of guts. Now this character is very muscular. He actually doesn't have a lot of bony landmarks. So I'm not going to paint too many areas of bone on this guy, only where it's close to the surface on top of muscle, like his skull and his nose ridge. If you're doing this on a character that's really skinny and bony, then you're going to have a lot more bone showing through. So I'm going to pick a nice kind of soft brush. There's one I like called Knife Paint Soft. And with this, I'm going to paint anywhere that I feel like if I cut very deep at all, it's going to hit bone because it's very close to the surface. Now, don't worry if your mask is really sharp and sort of unrealistic. We're going to soften it up and make it look a little bit more natural. And I'm going to get the ridge of the nose right here. Can do basically the entire skull and not the temple because you actually have a big muscle on your temple. Now, for the sake of time, I'm only going to focus on the head, but you can go as detailed with this as you want. Now, on the bone mask, I'm going to add a filter to blur it, and that should soften up our paint job there. And of course, we can always refine this by adding or removing it. And right now, I'm just using a noisy brush to break up the transition between the meat and the bone. It does look a little weird when you see the entire under layer as it is right now, but remember, we're only going to see little glimpses of this. We're not going to see all of this underpainting. Only where the character is the most rotten is it going to show through. And you can see I like to add a little bit of noise so it's a really gradual transition. So it looks like there's still meat and tissue on the surface of the bone. I don't want to see a sharp transition. It doesn't feel very realistic to me. So I'm going to call the underlayer done. Let's group all of our bone and all of our guts into one group that we can paint at the same time. So at the very top of everything I'm going to add another folder. And I'll call this zombie underlayer. And let's drag the bone and the zombie guts folder into the zombie underlayer folder. So now we have one group called zombie underlayer, which we can paint all at once. And here's how that looks. I'm going to add a black mask to zombie underlayer and I can start painting and we can see it reveals our entire underlayer, all that work we did in one brush stroke, which is really cool. Okay, let's paint a quick test mask to see how this looks. I'm going to turn off symmetry. And if you click here on this button, you can look at all the available alphas for the brushes. There's one that I like for this called frog skin. And with this, you can just kind of click and it creates this stringy rotten mess. Another cool way to use it is to make a big area like that and then invert and remove it. And you get this sort of inverted effect, which also looks pretty gross. So let's just paint a section of rotten skin here. And this is looking pretty good. It's kind of working as expected, but I, I want a little bit more. I want the edges to sort of darken so it doesn't look like such a clean transition from relatively healthy skin to completely missing skin. I want sort of a rotten transitional edge. So here's how we set that up. And for this, I'm going to use that same technique that we talked about earlier called anchor points. And we actually have a video on this technique in the channel. So I'm going to undo all that painting. I'm going to click on my zombie underlayer mask and let's add a paint and I'm also going to add an anchor point. It's very important that this anchor point is on top of anything that we paint here. Now on this paint layer, I'm just going to really quickly do a temporary stamp like this just for now. And I think we can reuse our bruise material as the rotten edge of this wound. So I'm going to take my bruises folder. I'm going to duplicate the whole thing. Let's move it on top of the zombie under layer. And I'm going to rename this rotten edge. And I'm going to add a new fresh black mask to sort of reset the rotten edges. Now we're going to utilize this anchor point right here to control the mask of rotten edges automatically. So wherever I paint here on the zombie underlayer, 
the rotten edges will automatically update and create sort of a soft, blurry, expanded edge around the border of my wound here. So on the rotten edges mask, I'm going to add a fill. And then instead of a color or a pattern, I'm going to click on anchor points here and I'm going to grab this one, zombie underlayer mask. So if I alt click on my zombie underlayer mask to view it, that's where I painted. And if I alt click on rotten edges, you can see the mask looks exactly the same. And just to prove it, if I go back to the paint for my zombie underlayer and I update the mask by painting another splotch right here, and then I alt click on my zombie underlayer mask, we can see that that updated there. And again, if I alt click on rotten edges, we can see it's exactly the same, it updated. So now let's apply some filters so that it's not exactly the same, but really it's sort of almost inverted and has like a blurry expanded edge. And again, if anchor points are confusing to you and you don't really know what they're doing, go back and watch our video on anchor points, link in the description. So in the rotten edge mask, I'm going to go here and add a new filter and I'll grab a filter called high pass. And we can see that that changes the values of the mask. Now I'm gonna add a levels filter and let's click invert. And I'm gonna grab this slider here and drag it to the left until the main section of the mask is still black. And now we can use these other two sliders to try to brighten up the edges of the shape. And you can see it's kind of creating this white halo around my underlayer mask. If I press M for material, I can see that the skin around the underlayer is revealing that sort of colorful bruise. Now it's a little too sharp, but it is working. You can see it looks like rotten skin. So let's add some more filters. So I'm gonna add a filter above levels and I'm gonna choose warp. And what this is gonna do is sort of mess up that edge so it doesn't perfectly follow the contours. Might be a little bit too intense, but you can see this just breaks it up. Let's also add blur so it's not so sharp. So filter blur. I'm gonna really expand this but that also darkens it down. It's not really very bright anymore. So we can add another level and just try to brighten this up. And now you can see it tints and darkens the skin around the wound. And this will update in real time. So if I go back to my zombie underlayer on the paint inside of the mask, when I paint, you can see it updates the skin to be sort of purple and rotten looking, which is really gross. If you use a very low opacity, you can see it sort of slowly discolors the skin. And as I paint more and more, it's almost like you're digging deeper into the layers, which again is super gross and super fitting. And the trick to this technique, I think, is to be very subtle with it. Maybe subtle's the wrong word. It's definitely not a subtle creature. He's pretty gross. But soft transitions look really cool with this because you get the blend from bruised to rotten to a gaping wound, and it just looks pretty cool. And with that, the building blocks are done and set up. So all that's needed now is for you to go back and adjust all of the colors that we created we have all the building blocks we need to make a really interesting zombie material. So I hope you learned a lot with that lesson. Don't forget that if you don't want to do any of that, you can go up on Render Create right now and download the zombie texture that I already made for this character. And whether you are going to use our zombie or make your own, be sure to share the results with us by tagging us on Instagram or sharing it on the Discord. And if you have any other ideas for either face paint or makeup or creature effects like these ones we've uploaded to the store, leave a comment and we'll try to make those for you. All right, later creators.